In the winter and spring of 1989 and 90, a triangular object with dazzling lights was seen by hundreds of people in the skies over Belgium and Germany. Hovering low above villages and towns, it was reported by civilians, teams of police and military personnel throughout the country. Then on March the 30th, 1990, two NATO radar stations at Semazaki and Glons simultaneously recorded an unidentified object passing south of Brussels. The Belgian Air Force scrambled two F-16s for an intercept. Their radars locked onto the object, the diamond. 100 meters in one second. As it dropped below 200 meters, it vanished from all radar screens. The Air Force had no explanation. One scientist suggested the pilots were chasing a rare atmospheric phenomenon. But the chase lasted 75 minutes, the object was seen on no less than five radar screens, and the testimony of hundreds of eyewitnesses remains. UFOs, we bring to them our own expectation of what they might be, what they could mean. Since the beginnings of history, experiences of the UFO have ranged from the sublime to the manifestly absurd. If reports are to be believed, but already the objects of much curiosity, and every year many hundreds of people claim to have come close to the UFO experience. Or you what? I mean, that could not be a weather balloon. That's impossible. Well, it's going up and then going over, reappearing. And it's sort of going in this sort of circle, isn't it? I'll tell you what, please, I've got them bloody film. One community that experienced the full force of a UFO flap was at Gulf Breeze in northern Florida. Over those dunes, right there. Over the dunes. Oh, my God. There she is. There she is, right there. Oh, my God. Okay. Kind of way out. There's That boat just went by. Jesus, when you know it. Property developer Ed Walters videoed that in November 1993, but it was only most recent of a sequence of events that took the whole community by storm. In 1987, he photographed these extraordinarily detailed UFOs with a simple Polaroid camera. The original Polaroids were extremely dark. This one was allegedly taken as a UFO hovered above a road. And then photo analysts light blasted them which revealed more detail in the emulsion layers. For many, at least, the photos proved that UFOs were here to stay. Others remain unconvinced. But the events put Gulf Breeze firmly on the media map. There are so many hundreds of other witnesses locally and thousands and thousands of other witnesses worldwide that uh, maybe haven't been exposed to the media like I have because maybe they haven't written a book or they haven't for whatever reason. So I don't think that it's a um, uh, Ed Walters story. Uh, I think that the UFO story stands on its own with thousands of other people standing up and saying, I know what I saw. With a naval base at the seaward end, the vast expanse of water and sky was ideal for the UFO enthusiasts beating a path to Gulf Breeze and nearby Pensacola. What is that baby doing? I don't know. It may look like it's moving around. It's that... I see two of them moving to the west, slowly. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on up there? There's two of them. Who is that? Look, 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 look. look. Yes. Right here, there it goes. Right here. Oh. Yo, look, it's right there. 
Just drop something out, Gary. Bruce and Anne Morrison now have five hours of video of the strange lights maneuvering above the bay. Look how it moves, Bruce. It's just. Oh, look at well, I was having lunch with a friend at work one day, and she had heard about the Gulf Breeze sightings, but they had not hit the papers in Pensacola. You know, Gulf Breeze is a little smaller communi community outside of Pensacola. And she started telling me about this man in Gulf Breeze who had taken all these beautiful pictures, and there had been articles about it in the Sentinel. And I remember my reaction was so strange because all of a sudden I looked at my arms and I had chill bumps all over me. It was just like, it was an overwhelming feeling of wonder, amazement, and extreme interest. Three minutes, 29 seconds. Oh, it's white. Right. Turn them white there. There's three of them. Yeah. Let's go what? Whoa, go, baby, go, Bubba. Come on over here and show us some more, Bubba. I can tell you right now, I, I have been out with people that would go bananas when they saw an airplane. In fact, there's a man that uh, comes out occasionally with our group that every airplane that flies over to him is a UFO, and he will get mad and irate if you look at him and say, that's an airplane. I mean, it can be a 727, 5,000 feet over your head, coming into the landing pattern at the Pensacola Airport. This guy will look up at it and say, that's a UFO. And that's his right. But I know what I saw. I know what's on my phone. And if you want to believe it, Fine. If you don't want to believe it, that's fine also. Oh! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh, it's got a green, got a green halo around it, doesn't it? Did y'all see green around it? Yeah. All right. Not surprisingly, Ed's photograph seemed too good to be true, and he soon found himself attacked by the debunkers. Well, it's really kind of shocking. I'm an average fella. I build houses. I'm a, I'm a working man, and for some. To see something so extraordinary and tell about it, and then to be blasted, it's shocking. Uh, you just don't expect that kind of reaction. You expect people to say, oh my gosh, rather than, oh, you're crazy. Over the dunes. Oh my gosh. There she is. There she is, right there. Oh my God. I would like for somebody in the um, military industrial complex for the world governments. I would like for somebody to come forward and say, don't worry, here's what it is, this is the answer, sleep well. But they don't do that. I think they don't know. I think that they're struggling just like we're struggling. I think that when there is a, 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 a flap, a UFO uh, flap, then I think that the military and the governments of the world are paying attention behind the, behind the scenes. The love-hate relationship between governments and UFOs was realized in the United States Air Force's Project Blue Book, set up to investigate cases like these during the 1950s and 60s. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory claimed that this is a light aircraft, but Lee Hansen, the photographer, is adamant that it was nothing of the sort. As James Waters drove through Monument Valley, a bright object sped past, followed by another a second later. Slowed down, the object seems to contract and expand. Official explanation, a meteorite. But two, one after the other. Two other classic UFO films were singled out for study by Project Blue Book. This filmed near Great Falls, Montana, and this in the skies above Utah. Alan Hynek, an astrophysicist, was brought in as a specialist consultant to the team. Initially skeptical, 
his attitude changed when these two films were analyzed. The Utah film had already been subjected to some thousand or so man hours of analysis by the Navy's photographic interpretation laboratory. So the panel uh, got up in their chairs and crouched around the wall to examine the films, and they asked to have the films run several times, as a matter of fact. Now, the Navy had, on the basis of their detailed analysis of the Utah films, they had concluded that the objects shown in the films could not be birds, balloons, aircraft, and so forth, but indeed that they were self-luminous, unidentified objects. Despite this conclusion, the panel rejected it and concluded that the objects were birds. They couldn't be unidentified, therefore they had to be birds. I came away from the meeting and from the room with the distinct feeling, however, that the panel had deliberately moved to debunk the whole subject and not to give it the serious scientific attention which it deserved. In the skies above Britain, a UFO appears from nowhere and flies alongside Concord. It seemed intelligently controlled, but cameras can lie. The flights were filmed with a specially designed periscope camera system, the Astrovision, which uses a complex arrangement of lenses and prisms. We asked Alan Tanner of the original British Airways film team to take a closer look. Now, this is probably the classic UFO shot that everybody refers to when they talk about uh, UFOs and Concorde. Again, you will find that it looks very similar to other shots that we've got uh, with funny little marks on it that people say, was this a UFO or wasn't it? Look at it closely and you'll find that there's that little spot of light coming there which could be quite easily mistaken for a UFO, but in fact it's quite possible that the sun which was off to the left-hand side, had caught the front element of the Astrovision periscope system and would have caused an internal reflection. And I feel that that is really sums it all up. You will see that as the camera moves, so that little spot moves. And I don't think that's a UFO. Above the Norfolk Broads, three fishermen film a diamond-shaped UFO. Checks were run on aircraft and weather balloons, but the skies were to all intents and purposes completely clear. Three months earlier, besides the Black Sea, a tourist videoed this. It seemed an extraordinary coincidence. Until we met Simon Nash of Panasonic. This is a, a basic iris motor. The principle of the iris motor is to regulate the amount of light entering the camera. The iris motor will open on very dull scenes and poorly illuminated scenes and close down on very high intensity or brightly lit scenes. We actually have no idea what this sort of object is here in the sky. It could be reflection from a plane or, or some other light source. But as the camera starts to zoom in, you can clearly see here the shape of the actual iris elements within the lens section of the camera. It appears to be caused by a reflection of light entering the front of the camera and bouncing around between the lens elements. And of course, sandwiched between the lens elements is, of course, the iris motor. And the iris motor takes on this characteristic shape that it is often seen when you're looking directly or, or indirectly in towards the sun. But the image at the beginning of the tape is quite unusual and is something that can't be explained by normal camera technology, if you like. Over the past 30 years, some 8,000 UFO sightings have been reported to a special department at the British Ministry of Defence. About 5% or 400 of these remain unidentified. Nick Pope is the man from the Ministry. The thing to stress is that 95%, I would say, of the reports that we get can be very easily explained. There is probably a hard core of about 5% which appear to defy explanation and of course we keep an open mind on them. But having said that, it doesn't mean that because something appears to defy explanation that in fact it, it couldn't be explained the very next day. Recently we've had an airship operating over the UK and that's been brightly illuminated from the inside. 
Now, when you see it from close up, it's very obviously an airship. But when you see it from a long distance away, it just looks like a very bright, cigar-shaped object. And, of course, that has generated an awful lot of UFO reports. Many reports continue to defy rational explanation. In a valley near Ottawa, the object on the right was apparently witnessed by more than a dozen people. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police said it was in fact a Sikorsky helicopter. But the Canadian Defence Department said there were no helicopters in the area. This curious object filmed above an English cornfield remains a mystery. The tractor driver in the distance said that he saw a small silver disc fly silently over him at speed. Whatever that is, that's moving on its own. As a TV cameraman was setting up for a weather picture in Wisconsin, an object flashed past the windmill. It's traveling at over a thousand miles an hour. He checked with a local airbase and with a NORAD defense network, but they had nothing to report. In Oxfordshire, while filming a farming program, a TV crew suddenly noticed this object over the fields. Well, first of all, we saw what appeared to be a very large vapour trail, much thicker than the normal vapour trails. And um, when this vapour trail finished, it stopped at a straight line, you know, as opposed to fading out. Um, the object, which was obviously circular and an orange-yellow colour, seemed to stop very slowly and then very quickly out of frame. And it went so quickly, just couldn't follow it. It seemed to be an amazing speed, it really was. Well, first of all, it was the vapour trail, which seemed to be suddenly appear. Um, the line in the sky before the vapour trail actually appeared was also visible, so it looked as though it, it must have passed overhead without us noticing it at all. But then the vapour trail itself was, um, may I say, sort of curly, as, as though the object that was leaving it was, in fact, spinning. Then, looking at the object itself, you could see with the naked eye that it was, in fact, spinning, and orange and round. Over three and a half thousand UFO reports worldwide have come from civilian and military pilots, people like Colonel Fletcher Prouty, who commanded an air squadron based in Tokyo in the 1950s. He was one of the five founders of the massive NORAD defense network. My aircraft were in the sky over half the world, regularly, all the time. And one day I got a top secret uh, memorandum delivered from the White House, from the uh, headquarters of the Air Force. And it ordered me, and it ordered me to tell my crews that if ever they saw an object that was unidentified, they were to report it to me. I was to set them down and take their depositions, sworn statements, and then mail them to a certain office in the Pentagon. And one day, one of my crews on a flight from Honolulu to Tokyo saw something that they had to report. And they walked in my office that morning, and the, uh, the captain of the crew was an old acquaintance of mine. He said, Colonel, I'm uh, really a little embarrassed today. He said, because we're going to get involved in a lot of paperwork. He said, we saw an unidentified object flying beside our aircraft for over an hour last night between Midway and Tokyo. We had 60 passengers aboard. There's no way we can say that it wasn't seen and it wasn't there. So I had 12 men in the crew. I had to set aside 12 rooms with 12 interrogators. We had them write their stories down what they saw. I packaged that all up and sent it to the headquarters Air Force. Never heard another word from it. In America, secrecy remains the order of the day, partly a legacy of the Cold War and new weapons development. But in Russia, things seem to be changing. 
We were given unique access to leading military figures in the former Soviet Union, who not only came forward with their own testimony, but discussed research projects linked to UFO incidents. Now, hundreds are reported every month to UFO groups and the military authorities. As a Russian film crew were making a music video, watching crowds saw this object appear of the center of Tbilisi. In Moscow, a KGB officer and his family film a group of unidentified lights. Until very recently, people never dared report UFOs, let alone release pictures like these. For years, the old secret regimes prevented anyone admitting to any UFO experience. Now, for the first time, General Major Boris Surikov was able to tell us about an unidentified flying object encountered during the Second World War. As it approached, it electrically charged their bomber, threatening a massive fuel explosion. To save the plane, they jettisoned the bomb load but reported their mission a complete success for fear of reprisals. A shape something like this. Here, a ray of fire. This part is reddish. The bow is light. And it was flying at a great speed. It was lighting up the air around it. It looked like a miniature sunset. In the center there was a strange looking flying object. It did not look at all like an anti-aircraft explosion. The diameter of a flare from an anti-aircraft missile explosion is about 10 meters. Here it was larger and it was longer than our Buran or an Energia shuttle. I think it was about twice as long. And it isn't the type of thing which we or the Americans launch into space. One incident which revolutionized Russian military thinking about UFOs happened on the 20th of September 1977 at Petrosovotsk on the Russian Finnish border. At about four in the morning, over 170 witnesses, including 20 border guards and police, saw a large glowing object raining down beams of light. It hovered over the town for some 15 minutes before moving off towards the Finnish border. But it had been seen over a wide area for at least four hours before that. Colonel Boris Sokolov headed the Ministry of Defense's investigation team. Later, having read the report, I found that a large group of military men had witnessed the event about several hundred kilometers away from Petrozavodsk, in one of the border regions. When they tried to report it using their usual field communications, they had telephone and cable lines, radio and shortwave, none of them worked. After the incident, which had lasted for several hours over Petrozavodsk, and a little shorter period of time over the border area, all communications were suddenly restored. This event so concerned the military that for the first time they and the scientists began a unique state-funded research project. The Russian Academy of Sciences and the Ministry of Defense in Moscow were able to draw on a potential observer force of some six million troops. It was a huge number, an experiment that will never be repeated. It lasted 10 years and the whole of the Soviet Union was involved, one-sixth of the globe. And the number of potential observers was over 10 million. <laughs> 
Up until now, this incident has always been dismissed as disinformation, a cover story for secret rocket launching. Now, for the first time, Colonel Sokolov has testified to the actual events that led to one of the world's most extensive UFO research projects. If UFOs are tangible objects, they seem to demonstrate an extraordinary technology. In Moscow, there's a state-funded organization that is actively investigating new propulsion systems based on UFO reports. Dr. Anatoly Akimov is the director. We are not looking to limit our research objectives by just trying to explain abnormal physical experiments. What we are trying to do is to go beyond the normal investigative boundaries. If we believe, and we certainly have good reason to do so, that the UFOs exist as a real phenomenon, then naturally the question arises as to whether our contemporary science can come to some understanding of them. In stark contrast to the openness of the Russians, the British Ministry of Defence are still denying an incident that happened in 1980 here at the Woodbridge Joint British-American Air Force Base. This was one of the busiest military air bases in the United Kingdom. Its activities were highly secret, and it held one of NATO's largest nuclear weapons stockpiles. It was in the early hours of December the 28th that two teams of base security officers left the East Gate to investigate strange lights in the forest. One team included the deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Holt, and in the other group was Larry Warren, then aged 19. I'm standing in Rendlesham Forest, where on December 28th to 29th, 1980, just behind me, Colonel Holt and a group of NCOs and officers had their sighting of events, which is recorded on the tape that he made that night, about a quarter mile that way. My event took place right here, heading toward this farmer's field. I had no idea what was about to happen. No one else with me really did at that time at all, except that this field in front of me was illuminated with some very bright, strange light. I noticed that this giant oak tree here was illuminated as well. That was my first indication that something wasn't right in the field. As standard procedure, Lieutenant Colonel Holt was tape recording his team's progress through the forest. As they measured radiation levels, they spotted something through the trees. The voices you hear are from the actual tape. The pictures are a reconstruction. As Holt and his team were moving towards the light, Larry Warren and the others saw a curious circle of mist in the field in front of them. Out in front of me as we approached, I could see, as I was watching this mist on the ground, there was other Air Force personnel, security police, all throughout this field. Over in the distance was two uh, cameras, and one was a video camera, one was a motion picture camera, and at the time, the video cameras were very bulky technology, but I recognized it for what it was. Everything I saw in this field was documented on film that night, both on still photographs and on motion picture. There's no doubt about it. What I saw, I'll walk to the center of the area where this mist was. Uh, you can see it clearly. Ground zero. would be here. After watching this object on the ground, a red ball of light moved in. I thought it was an A-10 taxiing to RAF Woodbridge behind me, about a mile. Came in over that far stand of trees, stopped over the circular fog-like object on the ground, 
dispersed in an explosion of color that was soundless, heatless. And what happened was a transformation, somehow, of this mist to a structured object. It was about 30 feet at the base, 20 feet in height, and a bank of blue lights at the base of it, and mother of pearl or rainbow effect all over. It was very difficult to look directly at. The worst thing that happened to me was that when the event transpired, when there was that transformation, somehow, uh, some senior people ran off into these woods, into these fields, and left us here. We, and why I didn't run could have been shock or whatever, but a number of us ran, a number of us just stayed glued. military were not the only ones witnessing the events. From his house near the runway, local resident Jerry Harris watched the strange lights around the forest. I stood there for ages, it seemed like ages, watching this, and uh, they were dipping down behind the, the trees, they were going down behind the trees uh, and coming back up again, uh, and uh, sort of zigzagging about. I was like, if they were aeroplanes, they would crash into the forest because the, the runway's over there and they're over there. I heard these noises over the base. I heard voices shouting. Um, I couldn't hear what they were saying because there was a distance, but I could hear that the wind was in my direction. And also then I heard uh, vehicles start up and sort of drive off. Well, I imagine anyone could have made this up if they were very imaginative. However, um, I don't know why someone would have chosen to make it up and then carry it on for 14 years, when we all have certainly bills to pay, lives to live, other interests, you know. Uh, I don't think anyone could make this up. Uh, not the evidence. Actually, you could re remove me from the story, and you still have a story there. It's just not going to go away. This one will never go away. A strict security clampdown, denials, and other explanations quickly followed the incident. Orford Ness Lighthouse, six miles distant, was one. Others included meteorites, police cars, and bright stars. The alleged films and photographs have never been released, but one abiding piece of evidence remains. Lieutenant Colonel Holt's report, authenticated as genuine by the British Ministry of Defense. It was released three years later through pressure from Warren and others using the American Freedom of Information Act. We're about 150, 200 yards from the site. Everyone else is just deathly calm. There's no doubt about it, just some type of strange flash of red light ahead. There's yellow. I saw yellow tinge in it, too. Weird. I wasn't there at the time of the Woodbridge sighting, so I can't be sure what happened. It may well be that no explanation was found for what happened that night, but when we find no evidence of a threat, our involvement ends, so something can be unexplained, but not necessarily lead to any further official work. Despite government pronouncements, one man whose views cannot be ignored is Lord Peter Hill Norton, Admiral of the Fleet and Britain's former Chief of Defence Staff in the early 1970s. It seems to me that something physical took place. I have no doubt that something landed at this U.S. Air Force Base, and I have no doubt that it got the people concerned, the U.S. Air Force people and the commanding general at the base, into a very considerable state. My view is that the Ministry of Defense, who were repeatedly questioned about this, not only by me but by other people, have doggedly stuck to their normal line, which is that nothing which was of defense interest took place on that occasion. My position about this has always been quite clear. 
and I have said this both in public and on the television and on the radio, and I said it face to face to Lord Trefgarn when we met, either large numbers of people, including the commanding general at Bentwaters, were hallucinating, and for an American Air Force nuclear base, this is extremely dangerous, or what they say happened did happen. And in either of those circumstances, there can only be one answer, and that is that it was of extreme defense interest to the United Kingdom. And I have never had a satisfactory rebuttal of that view. Most UFO incidents are reported by ordinary people, and more often than not, the event itself can be deeply traumatic. But more traumatic is the secrecy machine that moves into action to deny, to ridicule, or even to threaten those who've unwittingly experienced something quite out of the ordinary. As a small community discovered when a UFO allegedly crashed near Roswell in New Mexico. He said, you did not see anything. There was no crash here. You don't go into town and make any rumors that you saw anything that there was any crashes. And he said, you could get in a lot of trouble. Well. I was a little agitated, a little mad about the situation when he called me an SOB to start with. And I said, hey, look, mister, I said, I'm a civilian and you can't do a damn thing to me. And he said, oh, yes, we can, mister. He said, somebody would be picking your bones out of the sand. The case of the crashed disc and its alien occupants has become an enduring UFO classic. On July the 2nd, 1947, near Roswell in New Mexico, an extraordinary collection of metallic and other debris was discovered by Mac Brazel, scattered widely over his ranch lands. A few days later, he contacted local Sheriff George Wilcox, who called the Roswell Army Air Base. They sent Major Jesse Marcel to investigate and to collect as much debris as possible. The Army issued a press release saying they'd recovered a crashed disc. But later that day, Major General Ramey denied the report, saying the debris was simply a grounded weather balloon. For Fred Whiting, of the Fund for UFO Research, the official conclusion simply didn't hold water. And with other researchers, he's filmed the testimonies of some surviving witnesses and their family members. Heretofore, stories of crash saucers were twice told tales. Uh, I have a brother who has a cousin who has an uncle whose barber says he knows someone who heard something. That has been the way most of these accounts have been circulating. That's very frustrating because you can't follow up on that. You can't ascertain what the facts are. And in all likelihood, the story is bogus because it's been told by so many people and, and therefore is, is quite distorted. Roswell is different. Roswell has a cast of characters who are known, most of whom are still alive even after 46 years, all of whom are extremely credible people. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all our activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. One evening we were watching TV and it was uh, on TV there was something about space and my grandmother looked over at me and she said, Barbara, do you believe in anything, you know, outside of the earth? And I said, you know I do. And she said, well, I have something that I would really like to tell you, but I don't want you to ever discuss this or tell anyone because I've never told anybody. She just wrote an article one time just and put flying saucer on it and that's all she had ever written down on a piece of paper. And I said, fine, what do, we, what do you need to tell me? And, she, you know, I, I thought it was going to be something completely different than what she told me. And she said, uh, in the 40s, there was a spacecraft, a flying saucer is what Big Mom called it, uh, crashed outside of Roswell. And I said, that's interesting. I said, how do you know about it, Big Mom? And she said, your grandfather, George, was as a sheriff at the time. When the incident happened, the military police came to the courthouse, to the jailhouse, and told George and I that if we ever told anything about this incident, talked about it in any way, that not only we would be killed, 
but the family, that they would cut, they would get the rest of the family. Why? What did he know? According to witnesses, the military had discovered something more than a crashed spacecraft. In the Army airbase, an autopsy was in progress, witnessed by a nurse, a close friend of the local mortician. She said when one of the hands was detached from the arm, and she said when they, the doctors turned it over, that she noticed on and they did, they made a notation. That's what she was doing, was trying to take notes and making notations for them. And they were all sick. But she said that on the tips of these little fingers, it looked like little pads with little, little holes that kind of looked like a small suction cup on each end of these fingers here. Said there was no thumb at all on that, they only had like the four fingers on that. I undertook an effort to try to find out if the Pentagon was still sticking to the weather balloon story. So I generated a series of letters through my senators and my congressmen, and I also urged other researchers to do the same thing. What we got was a very clear pattern of, of denial and buck passing. The people of New Mexico were also alerting their own congressman, Stephen Schiff, who took up the case on their behalf. From the statements of witnesses that, I, that I've seen or read, a number of individuals described that whatever it was that was recovered uh, from the area around, uh, uh, actually, Corona, New Mexico, uh, near Roswell, that it, apparently it was put in a special plane that was flown in for this purpose and that the, and, and that the materials were under armed guards because people described the MPs. And I, I think it's logical to say that weather balloons aren't normally flown by special planes under armed guard. So that by itself at least raises a legitimate question as to was this a weather balloon. I got a response from an Air Force colonel who just said, we've referred your request to the National Archives. And, you know, that, that simple, that quick. And so I contacted the Department of Defense again and received a response at a higher level. Uh, we're referring you to the National Archives. So I contacted the National Archives. And the National Archives responded to me that they didn't have any material on the Roswell incident. Now, needless to say, I considered this a runaround at the least. And uh, it was at that point that I asked our general accounting office uh, to assist me. The general accounting office at Congressman Schiff's request agreed to undertake an inquiry into whether or not there was a cover-up of information concerning uh, the Roswell events. Uh, an investigator was assigned to the case, uh, reporting back, of course, to the congressman's office, since the general accounting office is a creature of the Congress. It's the Congress's investigative arm. This investigator approached uh, uh, an official within the Air Force Congressional Liaison Office, the Director of Plans and Operations, Colonel Larry Shockley. The investigator said to Colonel Shockley, I'm interested in getting into the Roswell case. Colonel Shockley's response reportedly was, you've got no business getting into that. This is not the first, and I suspect nor will it be the last, such obstruction of this investigation. They didn't say, uh, Congressman Schiff, we have documents, but they are classified. You're going to have to go through certain procedures if you want access to them. Uh, that would have at least been a reasonable response. But to send me to an agency which doesn't have the documents, and by now they must know that, uh, that is not a reasonable response. Stephen Aftergood of the Federation of American Scientists believes there could be a less secretive and more mundane explanation. The National Archives reports that it has more than 300 million pages of classified documents from before 1960 alone that are awaiting declassification review. Uh, in other words, documents dating from pre-World War I through 1960. If we extrapolate that to a likely estimate for all classified documents through the present, I would say there have to be well in excess of a billion pages of classified documents uh, that are, are waiting for, for declassification review. The secrecy system has become reflexive. We are concealing a lot of information that is not genuinely sensitive. And ironically, we are probably not protecting those genuinely sensitive secrets adequately.
the Roswell incident in particular has been an enduring uh, story because there have been so many mixed signals from the government and above all because uh, there remains a quantity of government documents that have been kept secret uh, more than 45 years after the event. I think uh, a, a, a government accounting for this whole episode is long, long overdue, and um, people have every right to demand that uh, such an accounting be carried out. Whatever may have been legitimately secret uh, 45 years ago has diminished so greatly in sensitivity that the public interest in its disclosure far outweighs any conceivable sensitivity that might remain. Now what we need to do is we need to establish in the minds of the Congress, it's already firmly established in the minds of most of the UFO researchers in the United States and elsewhere around the world, that there is indeed a cover-up of information. For what reason? We can only speculate. To what end? We haven't the faintest idea. But the fact of the matter is, is that our government is not being responsive to its citizens uh, who want simply to know the facts. I think there's a big leap uh, that is made by some people from an unexplained incident to an explanation that, that invokes uh, sentient extraterrestrial entities that are somehow uh, uh, active on Earth. Um, I am not personally cognizant of, of any evidence to, to support that, um, but certainly there is a vast quantity of government documentation on the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects of, of one sort or another. A year has passed since Stephen Schiff and the others started looking for answers, and they're still waiting. The latest information is that all the documentation or methods traffic between the relevant air bases for the years 1945 to 1950 has been completely destroyed, contrary to government regulations, so the real truth behind Roswell may never be known. Whatever Roswell tells us, and whatever the outcome, the fact is that UFOs simply won't go away. And as thousands of reports continue to flood in year by year, people will be looking for answers. Whether they find them depends on how open our governments choose to be. The regime of secrecy is itself a legacy of the Cold War. As West meets East, could we not follow the Russian lead in attempting to find an answer to the mystery of the UFO phenomenon? We cannot rule out the possibility that creatures who may well be superior to us are interested in what is happening on our Earth. These unidentified flying objects that appear to display unique characteristics, such as their speed, their rapid maneuvering and so on, must be studied in the interest of mankind. I do not subscribe to the views that some ufologists hold that this is all in the mind. I believe that there is undoubtedly something or a number of things, they may be quite different things too, uh, in our atmosphere which is physical and were it to land could be seen and touched and photographed. And indeed there are people who say that all those things have already happened. I th hope that someday we find out what it's all about. But um, everybody loves a mystery and I think someday we'll know. It's changing shapes. It's like flashing out. Yeah, I, was, I noticed that. It's all like really bright, isn't it? And then Help. it's gone behind a oh, cloud. Oh no, it's something's flashing on the video, like the tape's running out or something. Oh wow, it's just shot up in the air. Oh wow, well, I didn't get it on tape. I don't believe it. <laughs> 